The Australian Society of Plastic Surgeons is the pink body for specialist plastic surgeons in Australia, and we're proud of the significant contributions to plastic and reconstructive research from our members. Today, we have Professor Anand Deva joining us to speak about his research on breast implant illness. Welcome, Professor Deva. Thank you. Professor Deva, you've published widely about adverse events related to breast implants. Can you give us uh, a few examples of common problems that can occur? Of course. Well, look, nothing lasts forever, and that particularly applies to breast implants. Um, so uh, I think uh, the commonest problem that we see in women who have implants, either for cosmetic surgery or reconstruction, is that the body's response to the implant, the capsule that surrounds it, becomes progressively harder, uh, and that's called capsular contracture. Uh, the consequence of that is that the implants become uh, more visible, they can become distorted, they can become painful, they can certainly cause a visible deformity, uh, and ultimately if the capsule is so thick and tight, it can actually cause a rupture of the implant. And that still represents the commonest reason why women come to us for revision surgery. But there are other complications as well. Uh, most of them occur uh, not immediately, but uh, over years. And these would include rotation of the implant, rupture without capsular contracture. Uh, and then of course, there is uh, one that has uh, got a lot of attention in recent years, which is a rare type of a cancer, a lymphoma, that has been reported related to textured breast implants. What is breast implant illness? We hear this term thrown around a fair bit. Um, and is removal of the implant the only solution to this problem? Yes, look, uh, breast implant illness is not a, a new uh, sort of phenomenon. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, there were some uh, case reports of women with implants that began to develop a range of systemic symptoms. So these are symptoms that affect the body from the top to the toe. Uh, it was thought that silicon might have triggered a sort of autoimmune type disease. Uh, that led, in fact, uh, to a ban on silicon in the United States and some regulatory action. Uh, and it followed uh, then uh, with a lot of uh, population-based research that seemed to show that the link between silicon and autoimmune disease was, was not there. In more recent years, particularly with the advent of social media, uh, we've seen an increasing number of women uh, report the same sort of symptoms. So these can range from chronic fatigue, joint pain, rashes, uh, swelling, um, in addition to psychological symptoms such as anxiety and depression. And so uh, these women have, have collect, uh, come together in social media and have, have coined the term breast implant illness. And, and so um, it, it describes, I guess, women with implants, once again, either for reconstruction or cosmetics that then develop a range of symptoms that affect almost every organ system. I actually prefer the term systemic symptoms associated with breast implants or SSBI. Uh, because there's still a lot of research to do to find out you know, why these women are developing symptoms and B, whether or not these symptoms are directly as a result of the implant or what's uh, going on around the implant. Okay. I just wonder, um, given all these symptoms, does bacterial infection play a big role in these adverse events related to breast implants? Well, look, I've studied uh, bacteria around breast implants for almost three decades, um, became first interested in capsular contracture, uh, and we've shown actually over uh, many years uh, through painstaking research that bacteria can cause inflammation around uh, uh, the implant and trigger an accelerated form of capsular contracture. There's also some evidence to show that bacterial inflammation may actually play a role in generating that uh, rare type of lymphoma as well. With breast implant illness or SSBI, the, the, the research is, is not so clear. Uh, there is certainly some evidence, and we are looking at this at the moment, that inflammation around implants might trigger an immune response and ultimately then drive some of these systemic symptoms. But the, it's much more complex than that, uh, in that um, there is an overlay of psychological symptoms. We're working very closely with the collaborators, particularly in in psychology, uh, because uh, a lot of these women actually uh, have underlying unhappiness associated with the implant first uh, when it first went in. So um, the short answer is, look, there could be a link back to bacterial in infection around implants triggering these systemic symptoms, but we have a lot more work to do to uh, show that, in fact, it's a significant driver.
Yeah, so that sounds tricky. Mm -hmm. It is uh, with research, particularly with you know, multifactorial drivers here. Uh, it's unpicking, I guess, a lot of that information and then um, generating good data and then using the data to then hopefully guide, um, uh, give us answers and then ultimately guide good practice. So there's been a, a fair bit of media coverage on this elegant recall mm -hmm. uh, of textured breast implants and tissue expanders. Um, Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that, Professor Deva, and, and perhaps, um, you know, talk about the Australian experience with the Allegan recall. So look, yeah, that had, did make headlines uh, a few years back, uh, and it, it relates to this lymphoma that I, I mentioned earlier. So it, it's a T-cell lymphoma, so a cancer of, of the immune system of the blood cells. Uh, and uh, it was reported back in the 90s, almost like a curiosity, oh, this uh, lymphoma was uh, associated with the, particularly around the fluid around breast implants. But around sort of 10 to 15 years ago, uh, an increasing number of cases began to be reported around the world. In Australia, actually, uh, because I guess uh, we used almost exclusively textured implants, started to report uh, quite a few cases. So uh, very proud of the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the society, the Australian society, uh, in conjunction with the TGA, our research group at Macquarie University, kind of started to look at these numbers and analyse the, the risk uh, that might be associated with ALCL. Uh, and in fact, that led to um, some landmark publications uh, as a result of this sort of collaborative research. The research showed very clearly that this tumour, uh, this lymphoma, was related uh, uh, to textured implants alone so that there has not been to date a case arising from a smooth implant now implants come in two sort of surfaces one is a slick or smooth surface and the other is a textured surface and so we began to study uh, factors that might uh, associate textured implants with this lymphoma and in fact came up with uh, hard research showing that the, the rougher the implant the higher the grade of the texture the more likelihood uh, the risk of this lymphoma. And that, in fact, in part led then to actually worldwide regulatory action. So our TGA in 2019 removed a number of high-risk textured devices from the Australian market, uh, and that uh, included the Allergan device. And then around the world, um, uh, other regulators like the US regulator then acted as well to um, have these devices recalled. Um, so it, it's a really good example of where uh, good research, good data, good evidence then leads to a good regulatory decision uh, and ultimately uh, protecting patients. So a really good example of what I call translational research. So from looking at something, going back to the laboratory, looking at uh, hard data and science, uh, then making a meaningful impact on patient safety and patient outcomes. And that's uh, what uh, drives a lot of us in, in research to see that meaningful outcome is, is really rewarding. I guess the final question is, how is research driving the future of breast implants? Where, where do you see breast implants going in the future? Uh, breast implants were first introduced in 1962, right? So that's uh, before I was born, not, not much before I was born. <laughs> so we are looking essentially at technology that's uh, many decades old. Um, you know, it is one of these devices that, uh, as you say, has periodic uh, scandals and crises. We had the PIP implant crisis where a French manufacturer was uh, actually taken to jail for, for not using medically, medical grade uh, silicon. Uh, that led to you know, a lot of harm to patients. Uh, similarly with uh, this lymphoma and now SSBI, every now and then we see a problem related to these implants. So I, I do believe that, um, you know, it's old technology. It's old technology which comes with a legacy of you know many many issues. Uh, you know we uh, as researchers, and I think not just in Australia but around the world, are looking at alternative technologies for breast reconstruction and cosmetic breast augmentation. Uh, and I think that's um, uh, you know a point of a lot of activity at the moment. I suspect uh, I'm at the sort of uh, last phase of my career now, but I suspect towards the end of my career. Um, breast implants may well be a legacy device that we don't use anymore uh, and that there are uh, you know, plenty of safer, better, <clears throat> perhaps more natural alternatives that will be developed uh, um, uh, for women. 
Thank you very much, Professor Deva, for bringing to light your research on breast implant illness and informing us all the good work you've been doing. Thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure talking to you. And uh, I do want to say that, um, you know, plastic surgeons are natural innovators. You know, we're always slightly lateral in terms of our thinking, not just uh, in research, but also in our clinical practice. And it's, I think, um, something that people don't often realise that capacity for innovation for lateral thinking is, is a real strength in our specialty. Absolutely. For more information, uh, please go to our Australian Society of Plastic Surgeon website, which is www.plasticsurgery.org.au. Thank you.